Welcome back to another segment of The Threshing Floor here with The Chronicle Project. Uh, in Saskatchewan, Canada. Did I did I mess that up sufficiently? See, Saskatchewan. Very first time we did that, I, th I thought you locked John on us when you tried that. <laughs> Saskatchewan, Canada. That's where they be. And uh, we're going through, uh, I guess, kind of right now, a little bit of an analysis for those of you who are hearing audio. We're just reading through what you know to be the first chapter of Genesis and what is basically called to chronicle in the... Uh, the translation, the, the rediscovery, the self-defining Hebrew that the Chronicle Project is putting together for the, the book of Genesis. So I want to read one more verse here, and we're going to go through this. Um, this is verse 6, and it says, And so to declare the supreme ones, so to exist a hollow expanse to cut inside the, that water, and so to exist that split across between that water to that water. Now again, I'm reading this as an English direct transliteration of the yes, Gothic characters. Yes. In the text themselves that Chris and the group have put on the website, we do have paraphrase which amplify and give you a better grasp of what's being spoken here. So verse 6, Chris. Um, very interesting. Okay. They using some technology of some kind, I have no idea how, they're able to divide planet-wide the water, and not, not necessarily a thick layer, it could be like 10 feet, for example, and what they did is they split this off of the surface of the whole planet, and then they literally raised it into orbit around the planet. And the person out there sitting there be like, what would be the purpose of that? So this would be the firmament? No, actually. This no. is a fascinating concept. They split this water, they crack it up into orbit around the atmosphere, and this has a significant effect. Uh, they've done computer models on this, because this is not unknown that this has occurred, uh, according to this writing. But what effect this has is that the sunlight coming in towards this, first off, harmful radiation gets screened out. Second, instead of the sun hitting all of its light straight onto the equator, it bends it like, like it would occur if it was going through a contact lens. And so it disperses light in a more even manner. Because of that, you're not going to end up with uh, desert areas around the equator. Anyone who knows how it works, the sun hits the equator, the heat disperses. swirls off, you know, disperses on both sides, and because of that, it drives areas of the water back, and you get bands of desert around the equator area. Using this system, you completely stop that from occurring and you, the planet will be much warmer and the heat will be more evenly distributed, the light will be more evenly distributed. You create a paradise on top of that by screening out the radiation. People live longer. A lot longer. You're looking at a lifespan of 800 years and people don't believe that but if you read through the Bible right after the flood you'll notice that the age of man starts dropping off yes. within generations significantly. Yeah. significantly. This is what was stopping the aging of man. And what we're dealing with here is a huge section of technology that could not be explained by a bunch of guys sitting around a campfire making these stories up. Okay, onward. So I guess in going through this we see a very different picture of Genesis, of the creation. We get a sense as well of these beings you call the Council, the Supreme Ones, that there's actually God has what subcontracted creation on one level? You want to say something about that? Because I'm. It, it's it's something always amazes me when, if you're a Christian and you hear this, you get all in some angst. Some people get very upset. Sure, that on, God didn't snap yeah. his fingers and have it happen. For some yeah. reason, I think it makes him less God. Yeah. And yet, someone fully capable of doing this, hiring someone, sure. having people under him to do all this work. How does that make him any less right. God? And I mean, they don't have any problem with the fact that God tells a prophet to go tell mm -hmm. whoever. Fair well, why doesn't God do the job himself? Answer, because we become mature by going through the process of what we're doing. And even the angels, by, by doing the work that they did to seed the earth, to put everything together on the earth, the knowledge that they would gain from that, the maturity that goes onward with that, the only way that you gain maturity is by doing and so God, in his wisdom, he has those beneath him 
do this stuff so that they can understand, so that they can obtain what they need to become a more mature being. That's why. So you shouldn't be freaked out by the fact that the angels did the work. No, and considering our own need to create, we mm -hmm. as beings have this yes. need to create, to have a very interactive with our environment and everything around us and form it to us, to our insides. We decorate our home based on personal tastes. I mean, the thought that God would have people working for him that had any less need. Yeah. That the angels had any less need. That they than had them. any less need than us. Yeah. This is very much what has occurred to the Bible, has created a very large distance between us yes. and our God. Yes. That is actually what I came away with as well, both here and in the rendering of what we've known as the commandments of the law, mm. which I think, again, reading that brought God closer to me and understanding. Yeah. These laws were not things that were given to stop us from doing things. Yeah. They were given to us as a way for us to not only survive, but to prosper. Yes. Yeah, and that, that has so changed how we viewed everything. Go ahead. I was gonna, going to say, actually, it helped us to avoid the pitfalls. All of those are there literally as stepping stones to make us better human beings along the path of where he intends us to go not as something to cage us in, but as literally something we would instruct our own children with. Sure. Um, I, I think it's very interesting. The way the Bible is done right now, God is the bad guy. Oh, he very much He's is. He's the bad guy all the way through. Yes. And what has shocked us as we have retranslated, I shouldn't say that, as we've restored what was originally mm -hmm. there, is that every single time... God is supposed to be the bad guy, or one of the well-known guys is the bad guy. It turns out they weren't. And the mistranslation just conveniently made God the bad guy. Just conveniently, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking in this case, made Noah the bad guy. And the funny part is when we restored it, it was the opposite. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I'll skip forward to um, chapter 2 of Genesis where the Nakash, it reads in the Bible, and the serpent was the most cunning of all. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Nakash, when he did what he did, he got Adam and Eve to put themselves under his authority. And when God came back, in your Bible, it says, and God cursed the earth and all the, which lived within it. Yeah. In the restoration, God looks at the Nakash and he says, you have cursed the earth and everything that's in it. Why? <clears throat> because when he got Adam and Eve to put them under him then God no longer had the legal right to interfere. And yeah. to show forward, when Jesus is um, ends up meeting the Nakash, called the adversary, the adversary says, he shows him all of the kingdoms and says, if you will worship me, I will give them to you. Why? Because it was his right. He was still the owner, the legal, rightful owner of the earth, which is why bad things happen to good people. So the next time you ask the question, why didn't God do something about that? The answer is because he's not legally allowed to, and God is bound by his own law. If he won't follow his law, why should anyone else? He maintains a following of his own law. There's a long story to go with that. You don't have time on these segments to go into it, but it's stuff we found which is amazing. Now, a little segment, if people have a chance, go forward and read the book of Nakah, which is the book of Noah. It's yes. Nakah. Okay, his name means to proceed. His grandfather's name, Methuselah, means when he dies, it will come. So each of the names is actually, I, I believe when we string them all together, they're actually going to be sentences telling us all about the history through the names of the people. But that, again, is another story. When Noah, there's the story when Noah gets drunk. And he goes into his tent and he rips the flap and he, and he takes his clothes off. doesn't realize the flap is open. He's laying naked and... Uh, Ham comes, Ham comes and sees, he goes and tells his brothers, Noah wakes up, curses his grandson, and makes uh, his and makes all of them yeah. to serve the brother. Okay? What a horrible man. If you read the restored version, what happens is this. Noah gets drunk, rips the tent, his son Ham sees it, goes to his brothers, and tries to use this event as proof that it's time to supplant daddy because he's not a fit leader anymore. Mm -hmm. So 
they call him the father of, sorry, the Ham, the father of, and they have a name there. The word is actually insurrection. It doesn't mean he had a kid named that, which is how they have it in the Bible. It means he developed this plan where he and his people, because this happened way after the flood, he and his people were going to dump daddy, he was going to put himself in power. And the brothers, instead of going with him, went to father, they were honorable. They covered their father, they repaired the thing on the tent. When daddy woke up, he was informed of what Ham attempted to do. And then Noah called on God and he said, I need you to help me put this down. God sent supreme ones. The supreme ones went and they took all of the people who were part of this insurrection and they then put them as servants into the house of Yafatha. And then the supreme ones stayed in his brother's house while they maintained this new order. Completely different story. And this we have found over and over and over and over this translation we have strangely strangely always makes the good guys the bad guys i don't think that's an accident no and we're going to come back for one final segment and uh we'll touch on a little bit more the impact of the restoration of what i see to be the true hebrew word of god we'll do that when we come back on the other side of the threshing floor i'm randy Morgan. 